Uh, hello and welcome to SAE Tomorrow Today. I am your host, Grayson Prulty. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Jody Kellman, head of Lyft Autonomous Lyft. Today's episode was fun. Today's episode revolved around trust, the role that trust will play for individuals and citizens to adopt autonomous vehicles. And expanding upon that, Jody discussed how the role the app will play in the future of autonomy and what the future of autonomy looks like for Lyft and why Lyft is truly a platform company. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the podcast, Jody. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to have you here because you're an incredible person who has a really bright vision for the future. And I can't wait for you to tell that story today. I am I'm so appreciative of that and, uh, and really excited to be chatting both with you and also your listeners. Jody, you're, you're the OG. You're the Don, the Donis. You've been at Lyft from 2015. The company has incredible highs, goes through an IPO. You get a payday. You're still there. Why? When I think about sort of my career tra- trajectory, I think p- folks who don't know me well, you know, if I, if I try and look at, at my LinkedIn and tell the story of who I am, now, I started my career a- in an NGO in rural Uganda, uh, and now I'm running self-driving technology at Lyft and in between sort of did stints on, on Obama's transition team working on uh, really how do you use technology to make government work better, uh, as well as at McKinsey working especially on sort of public-private partnerships. So how do we build the technology infrastructure that's going, going to sort of power the next generation of, of technology innovation? The way I think about my career, I've always been looking for places where I can balance what I call kind of means and ends. So I, I want to be at a place where I both like what we are trying to achieve and the mission that we have to have impact in the world, as well as the way that we try and achieve it. So the, the means by which we achieve it. And, you know, John and Logan, who are our co-founders, really brought Lyft to life with this mission to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation. And I think what is so continuously motivating to me almost seven years later is the fact that, you know, what, what we practice inside our building is very much what we preach outside of our building, which is that we want to be a part of a world where we are going to you know, bring fewer cars to the road, make sure more of those cars are electric. We pledge that 100% of our fleet is going to be electric by 2030, and that we are going to be a critical part of this transition to a future of autonomous electric vehicles coming to market in partnership with cities and citizens. And so I think, you know, for me, it's it's all about still being at a company that aligns with my values and that really lives out sort of lives out who it is and what it does every day. Lyft's always been unique. They had the the pink mustache back in the day, the the fist bumps. And I remember in LA you had those really cool cars. People put Christmas lights in and they do all these fun different experiences. It was Lyft. At the beginning of Lyft there were all these different sort of there were all these different drivers that we typically knew by name who each had their little iteration of what what the Lyft experience was. And I, I remember one of my first Lyft trips, it was with someone who was, uh, I was down in LA and was with someone who was an aspiring singer. And I got them, I think it was New Year's Eve. And I got the, we got the whole car singing this, uh, this old Lang Syne kind of round and chorus. And so I think In one, that's part of what's made Lyft unique in the future, two, or in the past. Two, when I think about sort of my role in in bringing out the Lyft of the future, what does it mean to translate this kind of really human touch to an autonomous vehicle experience? You know, that's that's where my world gets incredibly interesting and where I also feel, frankly, like a a real sense of responsibility to, to the the brand of hospitality that we've built over the last decade. You had one of those truly only in LA moments. You're in the, in the Lyft vehicle having this karaoke. And I'm going to go back in the, in the way back machine here. The uh, the former lead singer of the guess who Burton Cummings first comes down from Canada uh, at sunset strip partying. Who does he run into Jim Morrison, Jimbo Morrison of the doors and Burton on his first night in LA ends up driving Jim Morrison all around the Hollywood Hills because Jim Morrison couldn't drive because he was massively intoxicated. So Burton, for lack of a better term, became his Lyft driver. 
that evening, but you had one of those only in LA experiences. I love it. And it's also, you know, it's, it's the sort of surprise and delight of, uh, for me, you asked why I've been at the company so long, you know, it's, it's those moments of connection, whether it's with a driver or with another rider in a shared ride where you're just like, you're surprised by something. They change your day. I've gotten into lifts crying and have had my fellow passenger help make sure that I am going to be okay. And so I, I think, you know, we all live in these kind of, our lives are, are intersections of magical moments. And, and I think, you know, particularly in the last couple of years, as we've all been, been forced into our homes a bit more, I think I take that responsibility of really like thinking about how does transportation interact with those magical moments that, that much more seriously. Those magic moments, you have some really nice, interesting conversations. I can't tell you how many Lyft drivers throughout the years recommended great restaurants when I was traveling. It's just that fun thing with the local knowledge that you can't get unless you open your mouth and say, hello. I think that is one of the things you're going to start seeing in in our Lyft autonomous vehicles is things like localized recommendations, because that is one of the things you count on your Lyft driver for. And so when we think about sort of what does it look like to bring this experience into the Lyft experience into the future, that type of local expertise is going to very much carry forward into, into a future vision. Looking at that future vision, now you, now now we're in now we're in my funhouse with experiences. Will there be special bespoke lift vehicles with augmented glass? So you're driving through San Francisco, might recommend restaurants, or you're driving through LA, recommend restaurants, or perhaps um, you want to go do an activity. Is that where this is going? You're going to take all the power of technology, the overarching lift experience, and make it digital. You know, I really think about it sort of in in phases, and so at the beginning. We're going to roll out self-driving cars on Lyft and kind of pockets across our network. So, you know, for you as a Lyft rider, you're going to open up the Lyft app, for instance, in Las Vegas today and be able to take emotional self-driving car. Or you can take a traditional classic Lyft uh, if the ride isn't serviced by an AV. And you'll see the same thing launching in Miami with, with Argo and Ford later this year. And so the, the first step of this is really thinking about sort of what is it? What does a lift rider need from that moment that they get into the car? And you can imagine some of the things that aren't possible today, right? You don't, with a driver in, in the vehicle, they provide this amazing hospitality, but they also, you know, if you want to have, if you want, if I want to hop on a call with you, Grayson, and have one of our famous Grace and Jody <laughs> off the record chats that all of your listeners should join us for one of these one day, uh, you know, sometimes I don't feel that that I'm able to sort of truly be in my own private personal space, the same way, frankly, I would be in my own vehicle. And so I think the first step for us is really saying, you know, every self-driving ride should give you this time and space to fully be you. And whether that means expressing yourself, you know, in a business meeting or being able to you know, make a call to your doctor that maybe feels a little bit more personal than you could traditionally do on on uh, a shared commute, or you know whether it is you know I I just got back from from some time in Italy and as a Type A perfectionist I'm I'm trying to learn Italian and cannot stand the sound of my own voice while trying to practice Italian words and so you know for me it might just be a place to practice those top. 300 phrases where I'm trying to to really you know, grow myself in some way. And I think there is this magic of autonomous technology in specific, which is you, know, you can completely trust the safety of these vehicles, but you also really get back this time and space. And that's, that's one of the step changes I think we don't talk as much about as a society when we think about these vehicles coming to market. Time and space is a really valid point. Pre-pandemic, when I would use your service all the time, I'd speak in code words. And I feel bad for the driver trying to figure out what I'm trying to say because I'm speaking in code words to all these different things and the point that I was trying to get across. I would never have a real conversation in a lift just for for a variety of things I was discussing. Was that one of the main reasons why Lyft decided to go into the autonomous vehicle industry was to perfect that rider experience? Or, or what was the overarching reason why Lyft decided to expand into autonomy? 
I mean, so we started just as, as context, we started our autonomous program uh, back in, in 2016. So we were really, I would say, early into the world of understanding the transformation that that autonomy was going to make for the world and society. And for us, I think that, frankly, the motivating factor was not experience. I think one of the things we're probably proudest of is Lyft is the quality of our experience today. And we're much more more thinking about sort of how do we bring the quality of that experience into the future. But there is this sort of dramatic step change on two fronts that you end up seeing with autonomous vehicles. And the first is just around safety, right? So it's it's the 94% of traffic fatalities that would be preventable if you didn't have a human driver behind the wheel, right? We It just turns out we as humans are, are imperfect um, and the best drivers still you know, get distracted by moments and machines turn out to be much better at being able to do things like detect an object that's two full football fields away and make a decision about what to do when that that object is in the road. Uh, So I think the primary motivator for us was really on the safety front, which is if our mission is to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation, then we are always going to look for ways to make that as safe as possible. And that was really the step change we saw. The other was really on the environmental front, where we know that that AVs and EVs are going to really, they're, they're incredibly complementary technologies. Um, there's a reason we see most uh, AV providers launching on EV platforms or vehicle platforms. And so, you know, I think for us, there was also just this, this chance to step change the way we looked at, at reducing carbon emissions uh, and, and getting cars off the road. That goes right into the core brand value of Lyft. I think that Lyft has an incredible brand that has values and it's meaningful. You see the way that the the company's been operated since day one and the commitment to the environment is really smart, especially in this ESG world that we're, we're going into. So I give you a lot of that, but I think the brand means a lot more than that. I think the brand means a lot of things to a lot of people, but overall, I think it's a really great brand that consumers know, like, and trust. And I think, I mean, I'll, I'll just pile on there one you know, we've, we've talked about this at length, but I think that matters to me as an employee, right? That's, I am basically solving for those values when I make a decision about where I go to work every day. And then two, you know, on a consumer front, anytime you are introducing a disruptive technology like ride sharing 10 years ago, or like autonomous vehicles today, you really want to do it with a brand you trust. And frankly, uh, for me, it's a leadership team that I trust. And I want to make sure that I'm sort of, I'm taking my first AV ride from an app that I know or a a company that I know is going to sort of reflect my values. And so I think that's really one of the, the roles that Lyft is playing in this transition to an autonomous future is, you know, you know, you as Grayson can open up your Lyft app, which you've been using for 10 years to try out a self-driving ride for the first time. You know, for you, it would not be your first self-driving ride. But, <laughs> and I think what we're really finding, the more we talk to riders about this, this is really, it's almost before safety, people are thinking about this kind of familiarity as a core foundation of that trust equation for them. And so, you know, it's, it's jarring to try a new technology. The more you can do it, through a company that that you already know and trust, the easier it is to be comfortable, you know, really taking that literal for a self-driving ride. Lyft did it right going back a few years with the Aptiv partnership in Vegas where you'd get the app and you had the little guy who come on, oh, would you like to take the self-driving car? No, the thing was to believe it was a push notification, take the self-driving car. And I'd sit there in the valet, lines like the wind and the encore, and I would just watch. And, and nine out of 10 times the individual or individual take a photo with the car. They were so proud. Like there was this general excitement. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. That's what really started to, to build that public trust. Were there some really interesting takeaways from that pilot in Vegas that, wait a second, we learned this incredible facet or fact? I mean, I, I think this is, I would say, one of one of Lyft's best kept secrets, which is you know, we've done over, well over 100,000 of these rides to date with members of the public. These are paid rides the same way, you know, the same way you take any Lyft ride. Uh, you can take a self-driving ride in Vegas with Motional today. And I think, 
you know, for me, the, the real transformative moment in, in understanding how consumers were going to interact with this technology was, I think, at, at that first CES where we debuted the technology partnership with Aptiv. And I got to sit live with, with many of our customers as they were trying this technology for the first time. And there was almost this like amazingly predictable evolution of how they would interact with it, which was first they would think it was incredibly cool before they got into the ride. So they're taking pictures with the car. Then there was always this moment of nervous anticipation as sort of where someone's really watching the wheel of what the vehicle is doing to make sure it's going to do the right thing. So at the beginning, they're hyper attentive. There's almost the emotional response is almost nervousness. And somewhere between three and five minutes into the ride, they totally forget they're in it. They're on their phone. They're calling their mom. They're looking out the window at the Vegas Strip. <laughs> like it was remarkable. I mean, I, I partially experienced it because I was trying to tell people about the technology at the time and I couldn't get people to pay attention to me anymore. They just started to treat it like sort of a normal lift ride. And I think that's really been uh, the core insight that has driven a lot of this work that we've done over the past, you know, uh, I guess it's now three years and that we're bringing in into the work we're, we're doing to, to bring Argo's technology now to riders in, in Miami with Ford. People are less scared of this than you might think, right? When I talk about a robot car, depending on who you are in the population, it either sounds really exciting or really scary. And what we find is that when people interact with the technology, even a little bit, they start to trust it. And so, you know, if the first couple of years of what we were focused on was really trying to build trust with that vehicle, what we realized was that was actually a much, it, it was a much more solved problem because all you needed was that first few moments of interaction. And then you needed to be able to see that someone else was doing it. It needed to become a normalized thing. And so now we're much more focused on questions like, what do you actually want to do when you get into it? What, when you have all of this time and space to be you, what do you want to do with that? And, and so it's almost kind of, you know, I think of it as almost like moving up a Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you know, we, we thought about this as like we really needed to solve a, a trust and safety problem for people. And really, the problem we turn out to be spending our time solving is like, how do you want to use this time you get back? Um, and that's been really fun to move into that phase of development. Because w- without the trust, there's nothing there. And, you know, around the same time, SAE was going around the country doing demo days to invite the public about there's all this. The, the the outlet that will remain anonymous as consumers aren't ready for this. Consumers don't like this technology. Well, SAE published the data and some, along the same lines of your data, it's the complete opposite. The public is ready for this. They're accepting of this. We had this very nice elderly couple that drove all the way from Hershey, Pennsylvania to Detroit, Michigan to go for a ride because they wanted to experience this and tell their grandkids. It was these wonderful stories that we learned and uncovered. Oh, I mean, I remember trying to get people into cars at CES where they were begging. I mean, because we had a limited number of cars in that first in that first demonstration. And there were couples who exactly the same. It was like a 70 year old retired couple who'd driven in from Arizona to be able to try this. Like, you know, I got I got my mom's best friend into a car in Boston and I got the text message I got from her afterwards was you just crossed off the top item on my bucket list. I can die happy, which is I mean, not everyone has that reaction to, to traveling around in, in an autonomous vehicle. But it is a sort of surprisingly common thing we see in just because we get and one of the really fun parts of my job is we get all this user feedback from every ride we do. And the sort of theme of I just checked this off my bucket list turns out to be an incredibly common one. You know, I think it's 98% of our rides are, are five stars. It is people, people really like doing this. And I think they are ready for, for self-driving technology to be here. When we think about this as Lyft, kind of a, a big piece of our role is to continue to help self-driving providers get to market faster while the technology is still sort of rolling out in pockets. Um, because the, you know, the one thing that we're always balancing is actually at this point supply, or sorry, rather 
demand outstrips supply. So more people want to try this technology than we have self-driving cars to offer them. And I think, you know, one of the big roles we can play is helping, you know, companies like Waymo and Motional and, and Argo get onto the road faster. Argo's put me in the vehicle several times in Miami and driving around. No, I'm not the Alex Roy going every Thursday because he's an Argo employee, but I've been in the vehicle a few times and the reactions that I've seen there, the, the Miamians, they're ready for the technology. They, they want to experience technology. It's because Argo did a beautiful job of integrating it into the, into the local community. And then all of a sudden, so they've got this great technology. They figured out self-driving and then comes Lyft. So you bring the platform, let's call it the connective tissue that you're able to connect them to all the individuals in Miami that want to ride or the individuals that go to Miami. Will you, how is the partnership going to work? I saw the Lyft logo is going to be on the side of the vehicles. Will it just be, I open the Lyft app up and then very similar to Vegas. Oh, wait, oh, I can go in the Argo car. Will it be something very similar to that? Yeah, we always want to sort of treat, treat as foundational the idea that for a Lyft rider, this should feel like any other Lyft ride. So we're never going to send you a self-driving car that you don't want. But we also believe that this should feel just like any other mode of transportation in the Lyft app, whether it is a bike or a scooter or an integration with transit or just a classic Lyft ride. And so, you know, when when we launch with Argo in Miami, you'll be able to open up that Lyft app, you know, see that Argo Ford vehicle coming up in your what we call our mode selector. So our way of saying, you know, how do I how do I choose a ride? And uh, what we are hoping is that much as we've seen in other markets with other partners, our riders are are often going to choose to take a self-driving ride if it is the one that is sort of closest and available. And I think that's that's the other sort of insight here for us is you know, self-driving has to work as transportation. It can't just be a cool technology. And, and it is part of why you know, Lyft integrating this into a hybrid network of drivers of other forms of multimodal transportation is so critical because you know sometimes the AV is farther away or it can't handle a certain route or it's raining really hard and you know we, out of an abundance of caution, want to shut down the AV fleet. But as a rider, I just need to get where I'm going. And so the ability to bring something like an Argo and Ford vehicle to market with other forms of transportation in the Lyft app means you know, a rider never needs to worry about where they're going or sorry, getting where they're going. But you, know, you have this option to upgrade to, to a self-driving car if one is, is available to you. Is that one of the main competitive advantages when an Argo approaches you or a Waymo approaches you or let's just say Acme Autonomy approaches you and says, okay, our fleets right now on day one are going to operate in a limited domain, but our our data says that they want to go further. Is that the benefit? So if they want to go in the limited domain on the ODD, they can go in the Yargo vehicle. If they want to go to the airport, they can go in a normal lift vehicle. Is that one of the main advantages when these companies come to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Frankly, increasingly, we are starting to see that that AV companies kind of look at at Lyft as the inevitable path to market for for their self driving supply. Right, it, it, building a ride sharing network is is hard. It is you know we've spent over ten years optimizing everything from our marketplace and and driving up utilization in our fleet so that we can increase that revenue per mile to building out you know a fleet management capability that allows us to drive down cost per mile. And you know, I think. For AV companies, that ability to make sure that you can roll out your technology in a way that is going to be trusted by consumers, in a way that's going to be optimized for maximizing revenue, and in a way that's going to be optimized for minimizing cost is really sort of one of, not one of the key advantages. It's kind of, I would almost call it the the trifecta of, of why folks are, are really all looking to start bringing their technology to market through us. It's sort of worth talking about that that trusted relationship with a rider as well. I think you know we you and I have talked about this I think but like you know imagine 10 years ago someone saying to you Grayson like I am going to be able to open up a phone that's in my pocket and it will tell me it's safe to get into a car with a stranger. Like you would have looked at me like I was nuts. And I think that's sort of one of the other roles we can play, right? Where I think we're increasingly the the sort of 
the business side of this, I think, is getting much more attention in the press lately, which is sort of folks are starting to realize these are assets. We need to utilize them. I think increasingly AV companies are realizing that as they deploy this technology, they want to make sure they can maximize the utilization of that asset. Uh, and Lyft is is kind of the best way for them to do that. But I think from from our perspective, there's also just this 10-year track record of saying, hey, Lyft Rider, you can you can trust us to bring you something that is new and innovative and to do it the right way. And I think that's the other reason that that companies are, are turning to Lyft because we are so trusted by our ridership. Without trust, this entire business collapses. Without utilization, as these companies go public, you have no business. And so you've got two masters that you have to serve and you have to do it right. And Lyft comes in here and allows them to serve both businesses. Has Lyft's relationship changed with the atomic vehicle industry since Level 5 was sold off and now Lyft is, quote unquote, purely a platform now? Has it been like, oh, we want to work with you now where there's, there's no potential competition? So so for your, your listeners who are, are not familiar with Level 5, Level 5 was, uh, was Lyft's uh, self-driving technology division. So uh, in 2017, we launched an effort to actually build our own self-driving technology and uh, which was called Level Five, we sold it to to Toyota's Woven Planet earlier this year. And I, you know, what I would say is, like, the industry is just in a phase of rationalization where folks are realizing the number of engineers who are really qualified to work on building great self driving cars fairly low. The amount of capital required to bring self driving technology to market fairly high. And so I think, you know, not to sound too Adam Smith, but like, I think everyone is sort of going back to a world of of some version of specialization where, you know, what Lyft knows and has continued to know we do really well is build marketplaces that, (coughs) that efficiently and effectively connect a rider and some type of transportation supply. And what you do best is a platform. And so in the industry, consolidation is coming. You mentioned specializing of radar, specializing LIDAR, platform, drive trend. What's going to happen when consolidation comes and what benefits will there be for Lyft? So, I mean, I think the, the holy grail for everyone in the autonomous industry is to really bring the, it's autonomous vehicles everywhere that, that we can all bring online at a lower cost. Most of us who, who are autonomous nerds uh, and spend a fair amount of time on this realize that sort of one of the biggest costs in an autonomous system right now is, is the LiDAR technology, um, which is really one of the sort of specialized pieces of the stack. And I think what we are going to see as, as we see this continued sort of, I would call it kind of we're getting to a world where like there's the industry is the right size, where we're seeing sort of five to six really credible self-driving providers who are partnered up with vehicle manufacturers. Um, We're now seeing kind of talent and capital consolidate in the right way. The next step is is kind of the classic cost down. And so I think what that purchasing power is going to allow self-driving suppliers to to, and companies to, to bring this technology to market at a much lower price point that allows all of us to unlock kind of this real step change in in how some you know company like Lyft is providing transportation to our riders. I think a lot about the question of kind of transportation equity and things like, you know, in California, what we hear about are mothers waking up at 4.30 a.m. to travel on two buses and two trains to get to their job in San Francisco that they were priced out of, you know, in, in the latest housing market crunch. And I think you know, the, the next real moment that this consolidation is going to enable is first kind of get to driverless, then it's get to driverless at scale, then it's get to driverless at, at a reasonable cost. And I think what you're going to see is is that consolidation enabling this, this start of a cost down loop. It's going to be a positive for society. So that mom or that individual living doesn't have to get before 30 a.m. to take four or five different modes of transportation. The fully autonomous vehicle can pick them up and, and take them to their job. And I think a lot about it for children. If, if you want to send your children to an art school or to a better school, but the parent couldn't afford the transportation to get them there, well, there, here's an opportunity. 
think that's where this is going to become really, really special. That is, I mean, it, it is, it's interesting to work in a field that is sort of so focused on technology where the major transformations we are going to see are so human. And I think that is, I mean, I certainly don't get up every day because I have a particular interest in in the way that sort of the underlying robotics work. I get up every day because I can see that woman who doesn't, ha- like suddenly she gets breakfast with her kids instead of having to jump on planes, trains, and automobiles, right, to, to just make a living. And so I think you know, transportation is such a transformative element in our lives. And and we certainly saw that through the pandemic, right, where, where people needed suddenly to take Lyft to be able to get to their, you know, their critical jobs because public transportation was being shut down. And I, I think, you know, the more that we can find those sweet spots of where we are able to get transportation at the right price, at the right convenience to every consumer, the more we can sort of fundamentally transition the way that that people are able to enjoy their lives. Enjoy the lives, improve the lives. I mean, think about this where if that parent wanted to, you're in San Francisco, so they wanted to go down to the ocean or they wanted to go see the redwood trees, but they didn't have the ability to get there or go for a hike. Now you can have those experiences and think of those family bonding experiences and think about the positive impact that will have on the family unit. There's so many elements of positivity that autonomy will have that nobody, you're one of the rare individuals that actually talks about it. It's mostly, oh, it's an engineering problem. It's, an engineering problem. it's not an engineering problem. It says, how can we do good in society? How can we improve society? That's the overarching message here. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think about this. I'm a, a 30 year, 38 year old woman who does not currently have children. But would love to uh, one day. I'm I'm very you know uh, ho- hopeful that that will be a part of my life. But I mean, you know what I do. I I have a I do not have a forty hour a week job. Uh, I I work a lot, and I want every hour that I spend with my children to be quality time, not my ferrying them to a soccer game. And so I, I do think there is also this element that, that really no one talks about, which is in families, much of the transportation often falls on women. And especially for sort of my generation of working mothers, we are going to want to be able to know that our kid is going to get to soccer practice safely, be able to send them off with their friends, and then you know be able to have a really meaningful family dinner at the end of the day, right? This is it just is a difference in the way we spend our time. I, it's, I, I will, I'll come back to an odd example, which is when I really started thinking about this. But I remember when I lived in Uganda and I realized that there were no washing machines, right? There, you do sort of all the washing on, on these like hand cranked little tin, tin devices. And I suddenly realized how much time I got back in my life because I had a dishwasher and a washing machine. And that my life would be foundationally different if I had to spend three hours every two days washing clothes and and making sure that you know I, I lived in a, a clean home. And I do think, I mean, I, I haven't talked much about this. I don't think you and I have talked a huge amount about it. But I think the, the transformation of autonomous technology for women in specific is really something that I, I see as kind of equivalent to you know, the the introduction of the dishwasher or the washing machine for a woman in the household in the 1950s. Uh, and and I think that's going to be enormously transformative. It's going to have a, a huge positive impact. I am the dad taxi. I love being the, the dad taxi or the dad lift for this case. I, I love doing it. But if you have a larger family of three, four, five kids and one has soccer, one has ballet, one has gymnastics, and you had to, oh, I'm sorry, you can't do this because Kim has it this time. So, Bobby, you're going to have to wait to this time. But when you get to fully autonomous, you can put the, the children in the vehicle to send them to gymnastics or to baseball or to an activity. And I have this whole theory, and the, and I'm open to doing it, and we speak a lot about it in our house, is that you have a parent button. There's a camera that turns on so you can see the inside of the vehicle. And then when you get there, it's like, hi, coach. Okay, coach, we're going to unlock the door. And then you know the child safely with the coach or the guardian of, of that activity. You're going to improve a lot, a lot of lives. It's it's really 
remarkable when you think about it. And especially people who have less sort of flexible schedules, right, to be able to do this. It's it's just, it's a complete transformation. I think about partners of ours like Waymo who are already starting to think about, you know, putting, making sure there's there's a child seat in, in the back of their AVs. And I, I just, I love... I love that the industry is already starting to think about that, you know, even in its its relatively nascent years. But you can't forget about booster seats. So you go from child, you go from a car seat to a booster seat. So you can't forget about booster seats. <laughs> I I will pass along that feedback. That's this is what I do. Yeah, I'm I'm also you know I'm going to call you when I need all of the real the real kid tips, Grayson. Separate uh, you'll, you'll be a, you'll be a wonderful mother one day and I'll, and I'll share all the tips with you and I'll show you a photo one day of me going through the airport with the stroller on my back and my golf clubs here and it was it was it's fun you, you get used to this and you learn these things and um, years and years ago uh, I, I met with Mercedes-Benz R&D this is going back to when I lived in California they showed me some of the prototype S550s that they were building and they open up the trunk and I said oh that's a really great compute pack wrong answer I said excuse me our customers can't put their golf clubs in there. And so as we get to fully driverless vehicles, you have to be able to have room for the stroller, have to be able to ha- have room for all the stuff that has to travel with you. Because that's the, a lot of the thing that I see when you when you look at the autonomous vehicle industry today, the way the vehicles are designed, there's a lot of these things that for parents that are they're not designed into it. Well, well, I have a bugaboo. Well, how's the bugaboo's big? It's the buffalo. Yes, it's the big one. How are you going to fit it in here? Oh, we didn't think about that. There's all these little human elements that we, we have to think about. Have you seen any interesting design trends from Lyft's partners as it relates to accommodating for, for children or for large families? I mean, I think what we're really starting to see is is more a, a trend around auto manufacturers being really interested in designing for the ride sharing use case in specific. So, and, and I do mean sharing of a vehicle. So what, what we're seeing a lot of attention being paid to and really, really thoughtful attention is how do you design an autonomous vehicle where someone is comfortable sharing a ride with a stranger and there's no, no driver who's kind of, it turns out people kind of view the driver as an arbiter. And how do you make sure that people, you know, they have, sufficient personal space. They have a way to get help when they need it, but also, you know, that that they can continue to find the joy in those shared rides that that we see today. So maybe it is things like features to help them understand, you know, if we know that you are a Jim Morrison fan and I'm a Jim Morrison fan because you've already entered your music preferences in the Lyft app, maybe we can send each of you a nudge, you know, letting you know that that you might want to pick up a conversation about the doors. So, you know, I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the evolution is is really thinking about what does it mean to have shared space that is also private. Uh, and and we're seeing sort of innovations in the way that uh, the vehicle is laid out. We're seeing innovations in terms of sort of, and this is a place where, where you know, Lyft is, is very involved, but in, in terms of how you can make sure you can get help from someone in real time. If you're just confused about you know, where the vehicle is going or you you want to make sure that there is someone who can help you understand like how you're gonna open the door in your autonomous vehicle. Now, we're really making sure we're purpose designing these cars to be able not just to be sort of solo rides, but also to be, be accommodating of what we hope will be the future, which is really sort of autonomous, shared electric vehicles. Does that go back? This is a conversation you and I had a long, long time ago when about the dial, when they, you had individuals that couldn't figure out the app and so you had to build a, a phone line so they could call. Does that kind of go back to those early learnings that you did and you kind of just built upon that? Yeah, I, I think the the big thing that, that we've learned is the driver in your Lyft ride today does a lot. Right. So if you go, if you were to almost think about it as like a, when you, I actually encourage you to do it or your, your listeners to do it. But when you take your next Lyft ride, pay attention to every interaction point you have with the driver. So, Hey, my, my car is maybe around the block and I can't find my vehicle. Hey, I need to get into the car or I need to open the trunk to put luggage into the car. Oh, is my door closed? Am I safe? 
are, are my seat belts buckled and am I safe to start a ride? There are all of these interaction points that you have with a, you know, a Lyft driver today, a, a greeting when you get into the ride as, saying, hey, Grayson, how's, how's your day going? And so I think for us, the major insight is just, you know, it, it is, it's not a simple problem to solve to say, you know, how do I take everything that someone's relying on a Lyft driver for today and make sure we're translating that into products that are really easy to use and intuitive and uh, and elegant and bring that forward into uh, any self-driving ride you're taking on Lyft. Is that will be built into the app experience, all those little nuances and let's say it, familiarities? Yeah, so you can think about it as sort of a, a world in which we're going to have almost seamless handoffs between the Lyft app and then what we what we call kind of the Lyft in vehicle experience. So, you know, when I'm requesting a ride, I'm first learning about sort of a little bit about self-driving technology if it's my first ride and what's going to be different. You know, we may we instruct folks that they're going to have to walk a little bit because we need to make sure we're picking them up in safe locations. And then we're using that same app that you sort of know and trust to do things like unlock the door. So when I show up to my autonomous vehicle, I'm going to be able to use the Lyft app almost as a key to get in and then start the ride right from my Lyft app. At that point, we sort of hand over to this, this uh, you know, we, we informally inside our building call them the bellhops. They're kind of your concierges who help make sure that you are having you know, the best the best possible sort of first self-driving ride. And they are responsible for your your time in the vehicle uh, from start to finish. And we hand back to the app for things like, you know, lost and found, or you know, maybe, maybe I left something behind, or I just want to rate my ride and let, let you know how my first self-driving experience went. And so, you know, today that, that looks like sort of really a handoff to we're always going to keep a human in the loop at the beginning to make sure that that there's someone there who can always address sort of what what you need in real time. But over time, what will happen is each step of that process will become sort of automated, and you'll only rely on a human where who's you know behind the scenes where you really need immediate help. And that person will become list version of Mr. Jeeves. That's. <laughs> Uh, we will be hiring you as our first uh, self-driving butler. Oh, thank you. I'll go. Hey, I like Alphas. I'll get all dressed up. I'll try and do an English accent and we'll have a good time. I was going to say, I can imagine the marketing materials now. <laughs> I won't do the accent here, but offline I'll do it for you. So let, let's fast forward 20 years. What type of company will Lyft be? I've talked about this a little bit with, with sort of my team as we, it, frankly, the last few years were hard, right? I mean, going through a global pandemic, we went public, you know, top of the world, and then you go through a global pandemic. And that's hard both because we're a transportation company, we're incredibly exposed to that. And then, you know, we're also a very culture-driven company. And so just not being with each other has been extremely hard just on a sort of interpersonal level for those of us who really, many of us join Lyft because the, the company's culture resonates. And so, you know, what I had said to my team was, it's going to be an incredibly tough sort of year, year and a half. I don't have a perfect, at the time, it was sort of start of the pandemic. So year ahead of us. But if we make it through this year, I think we are a hundred year plus company. You know, I think we will rise to be sort of in the great companies of, um, of the 21st, I guess we're in the 20, are we in the 20? First century, goodness, it's so crazy. We're living in a we're living in an interesting time. That's the, I'll call it the interesting century. Sure. Yeah, the interesting century. I can't. It's, time has lost all meaning in the pandemic to me. But you know, I think what you are going to see from us twenty years from now is we are just going to continue to focus on. I think the mantra you will always hear from Lyft is how do we improve people's lives. I think what will be really interesting is as we start saying, you know, what does transportation mean to us? How broad can that definition be? You know, we've, we've frankly explicitly stayed out of things like the logistics business because that wasn't 
sort of as front and center in how we meet that core part of our mission. But I think what you'll see is us continuing to innovate around that improvement and always saying, you know, when we look at a Lyft rider, what are the ways that Lyft can play in their lives to continue to make it better, easier, uh, faster, give them time back, give them money back, give them convenience. I think those will all be sort of words that continue to define what we do. Uh, but at this core, there's always going to be this concept of how do we do that while improving lives. Lyft's an inspirational company, but you're an inspirational person. What you've done from Uganda throughout throughout your career, it's special. You're an inspiration to, to millions of young girls around the around the world thank you Grace. and, and I, I i am a father of, of of a young daughter and and, and hope she can aspire to do as good as, as you've done and i love to know what advice would you have for a young lady who's interested in, in exploring a career in technology i think my biggest advice would be to follow the problem that captures your imagination so, I mean, you and I have, have talked about this. I, I have an undergraduate degree in social studies and a master's degree in international relations. By sort of, but by right, I have no right to be working on this problem. I have no right to be sort of the person who brought Lyft into the self-driving world. It was an accident where, you know, the first self-driving partnership we looked at was a public-private partnership. And I was working on products that were more related to sort of our public domain. But trusting, learning to trust your instincts on chasing the problem that interests you is, I think, the most beautiful gift I wish I could have given myself earlier in life. And I think once I started fully orienting my career around trusting myself to catch up on content, as long as I believe the problem was interesting enough, I think is the, the single biggest piece of advice I would give. Let let nothing constrain you, but that's a much harder, it's much harder to live the let nothing constrain you and, and don't doubt yourself. Uh, it's, it's easier to kind of say, trust your instincts on when there is an, a hard and interesting problem, you will figure out how to solve it. Politics is a hard and interesting problem. And the big question is, when are you going to run for Senate? Well, when are you managing my campaign? Whenever you want to go, <laughs> I'm there. I'll drop it all and we'll win. I'll, I will. Uh, I will keep you posted. I, I think we'd have to figure out a state. Uh, you know, a, a there, there's a few roads between here and there. Let's let's get self-driving cars on the road at scale, and then we can talk. Uh, then we can talk senatorial politics. Okay, deal. So when when Lyft scales to be a hundred year plus company, you feel that they're on the right track. AVs are, are cooking. Then we're gonna run for Senate and I'll run your campaign will win and you will do great things in the United States Senate because you are a true leader. You are a true inspiration, Jody. And as we look to wrap up this extremely insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? I think I want them to take away the idea. It's a hard moment to believe that change and progress is possible. We're in a difficult moment for the world. And I think the biggest thing I want them to take away is you and I get the privilege of living progress in our day-to-day -day lives and getting to see that and getting to find that inspiration and joy. And so I, I, I think my my biggest takeaway for, for your listeners is, you know, I'm really proud to hopefully be part of, of bringing something to market that is is going to have a positive impact on your lives, but also just you know to to continue to find ways to to make your own progress uh, in the world is is something that that I I really hope we don't give up on. I guess I would say as a society as a country we'll never give up as, as two individuals we'll never give up because today is tomorrow tomorrow is today and the future is trust and as jody says never give up and find your inspiration and run with it jody thank you so much for coming on the sae tomorrow today podcast so fantastic to be here as always thank you for listening to sae tomorrow today if you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more please kindly rate review and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. 
Be sure to join us next week when I sit down with Ollie County, Vice President and General Manager in Video Automotive. On this episode, we're going to discuss NVIDIA's growing automotive business and the role that GPUs will play in the future of autonomy. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.